Hi, this is three heuristics for fostering high trust generative culture. My name is Paul Tevis. Uh, I'm the people and culture guy at the tech conference, as I usually am. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Uh, I started my career as a software engineer, engineering manager, spent some time as an agile coach, uh, and spent some time in learning and development. Now I run a small company with my two business partners where we help organizations with their interpersonal and cultural practices in ways that produce better business results. And that's what I'm here to talk with you all about today. So let's get going. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you have read the 2023 Accelerate State of DevOps report. This is not a judgment. I'm just assessing the state of, of information in the room. OK, OK, cool. I just want to know where I can start, what do I need to explain with. I'm going to ask two more questions that are also of that assessing where we're at stage. Cool. So second question, raise your hand if you've heard of the Westrum typology of organizational cultures. If you were in the room for Cote's talk this morning, you at least saw it on one slide. So lower if you kind of know what it is, high if you like, I can explain it, we use it all the time. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Okay, cool. Third question for you. Uh, I want you to raise your hand if your organization has made an explicit goal of creating a Westrum generative culture. That is about what I expected. Um, the fact that your hands are not up is fine, because the things that I'm going to give you today are things that you can do that help to foster this type of culture and also make you personally more effective if you do them. So, a little bit of overview. Ron Westrom, he was a safety researcher and a sociologist studying high risk, high complexity environments. And one of the things he found in his research is that information flow predicts organizational outcomes in safety, in safety contexts. And so he developed an instrument for assessing information flow in culture, which is the slide that if you were here for Cote's talk, you saw, right? He said that organizations, we can categorize the way information flows through them into sort of three different buckets. And these are organizational behaviors, like things that we would see in each of these cultures that tell us about how information flows through that. This shows up in the DevOps world in 2014. In the State of DevOps report, they're looking for a way to assess culture. Westrom has this instrument, so they start studying it. And one of the things they find is these are not just predictive of safety outcomes, but of organizational performance as well. And that is a result that bears through every year in the State of DevOps report up till this year, where they find technical practices are important, but they're enabled by this type of generative culture. And in fact, every good thing that they studied in the 2023 report is strongly predicted by the presence of a Westrom generative style culture. So every good thing that you want is informed by doing this type of work. So the question is, great, how do we get one of those? How do we foster that type of generative culture? And this is the question that my business partner, Allison Pollard, and I have been digging into for a number of years. We work, as I said, with individuals and leaders and organizations to help them show up more effectively, have more productive interactions. Uh, and so we've been looking at what are things that individuals can do that foster the types of organizational behaviors we need in order to get these better DevOps results. And that's what I want to talk with you here today is those things. We want to focus on the individual actions because as John Shook reminds us, the way you create cultural change in an organization is by acting your way to a new way of thinking. You don't try to convince people that they should do a thing. You get them to start doing the thing and that then causes them to learn stuff and to realize, oh, there's actually a better way of doing this. So what are individual guidelines for action that we can use that help us get more of this stuff? that help us to get higher degrees of cooperation, that help us to train our messengers, that help us to do these things. So that's the lens, so individual actions that predict organizational behaviors that get us better organizational results. So where we start with on all of that is conversations. Because as it turns out, that is where culture manifests and where culture is embodied. And where, remember, Westrom's work is around information flow. Most of the information that is flowing in an organization is happening in one-on-one -on -one interactions and in group conversations. So we need to get those right in order to enable these behaviors. The problem, of course, is that conversations are hard. I have all three of these books on my bookshelf. I've read all of them. They're all wonderful, but they all have like 17-step processes. And another thing that we know is that under stress and uncertainty, when the compliance team shows up and says, hey, we need to spin up another instance in order to deal with GPDR, you can't think through with the 17 steps. 
What you need are heuristics, right? Heuristics, rules of thumb. These are mental shortcuts that allow us to reduce our cognitive load and produce good enough results. So what Allison and I have been doing is working on a set of heuristics that allow us to have better individual interactions that lead to better organizational results. And what we've identified are six different failure modes and three different heuristics that help us stay out of those failure states that get us more towards that Western-style generative culture. With me so far? Okay, cool. So let's go through these six failure modes. I'm gonna ask you to take a look at yourself as you're doing this, because what these are about is the way people experience you in an interaction. You also experience them, but we're gonna focus on you for a minute. Step outside yourself and think about how have I been described? Do any of these sound familiar? Are these, how do I show up? Not how do I feel, but how do other people experience me? So this first failure mode is what we call vague. So when you are vague, people experience you in a way where they don't know what you think, what you feel, what you want, what data you're working from, what your conclusions are, if you've even come to a conclusion, who knows, right? Vague is very squishy. Right? It can sound like, look, look the details don't matter. Just, just deal with it. And you're like, what does dealing with it even mean? When we're vague, you can see how this impacts information flow. Information's not flowing in a way that's useful. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, however, we have another failure mode that sometimes is the, the it's really kind of the polar opposite of this. And this is where we are rigid. So rigid, when someone experiences me as rigid, it means that they know exactly what I think and what I want, and that is how it's going to be. The picture I'm painting is so clear and so detailed, there is no room for them in it. It's inflexible, I'm not open to influence. I don't know if anybody else has ever been described this way, but I know that I have, right? This is rigid is very much the we're doing it my way. Both of those get in the way of useful information flow in an organization. They're both failure modes. And the useful spot to, is to be somewhere between those two modes. And so this heuristic is what we call being clear. Being clear is when you avoid the traps of being vague and being rigid. You're sharing the information you have, you're sharing your reasoning, you're sharing how you got there, and you're also sharing how strongly you believe those things, where you're open to influence, what you're willing to be flexible on. So people know where you stand, but they also have a sense of how they can participate with you. And so it can sound like things like this, including what we know is and what we don't know is, because clarity is not the same as certainty. We can actually be very clear about what we do not know. And that can be really powerful in a conversation and in an organization. So we can see that when we're clear, that contributes to some of these organizational behaviors, right? We're not gonna get to high cooperation if we're not making clear asks from other people if we're not training our messengers. So we can see how these individual behaviors, and by the way, those of you who are frantically typing, I'll make the slides available at the end. So the second pair of failure modes, right, is the first one starts with being uninterested. Right, if the first pair is about you knowing what I think, this failure mode is about me not knowing what you think, what information you have, what data you're working with, right? So I'm not asking about your perspectives, your feelings, right? That can sound like things like, well, that's just not how we do things around here. I'm not expressing an interest in what's going on with the person I'm having that interaction and that conversation with. Now, of course, there's another failure mode that you can probably see where this might be going on the other end of it that also has to do with asking questions. That's when I'm asking so many questions that they're laced in a lot of ways with judgment or blame. This, by the way, is one of my favorites. Right? I build a house here, I get really curious, and I ask a lot of questions, and then people feel like they're being interrogated. Because right? I accidentally, when I'm trying to dig into stuff, figure out what's happening, and I ask things like, so why would you do it that way? Right? So I'm trying to find out what's going on, but I'm doing it in a way that's not contributing to them actually sharing the useful information. Right? Blameless postmortems are about avoiding this kind of interrogation. So again, the useful spot to be is somewhere along this spectrum in what we call curious. So clear was our first one, curious is our second one. Right, where we're asking about things, we're getting information from the other person, but we're doing it in a way that feels like we're partnering with them, like that we're there with them in the conversation, and it's flowing well. You know, what do you notice? What do you recommend? How important is this to you? 
where else might this happen? Because when we individually start to get curious, when there's a pattern of curiosity in our organization, then we can see how this maps to some of those other behaviors at the organizational level uh, from, a, from that Western generative culture standpoint, right? Where we start to see things like failure occurs, we get interested, right? We engage in inquiry, right? Something new and unexpected happens. What can we, how can we capitalize on that? What can we do? If we're not being curious at the individual level, we're not gonna see this at the organizational level. So that's the second pair, right? Where we think about being clear, being curious to avoid those four failure modes. The last pair starts with being distant, right? Distant is where I may know what you think and what your perspectives are, and it really seems like I don't care, right? Distant is when you're in a conversation with me and it's like I'm not even there. I'm off on some other planet. I'm talking about things that aren't relevant to you. It, it's, it, we're disconnected in a lot of ways. Um, Sure, sure, that doesn't matter right now. Or perhaps even worse, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. Right? You're not interested, you don't express care about what I am experiencing. So that's distant. And at the other end, we have glued. So glued is actually when you express too much care about the other person, right? Where you're over attentive to their needs and their feelings. Where you're not able to do something because you're stuck with them. You're stuck to them. You can't maneuver separately from them. Where you don't tell somebody something because you're afraid about hurting their feelings or how they're gonna take it. You're glued to that other person. You're over attentive. And so, or you hang off their every word and you do everything that they suggest. I hear managers talk about this a lot. They're like, my people take the one idea that I threw out there that I was just, mm, and then they run with it. And that was an example of being glued. So again, the third place that's useful to be is connected, right? We're between distant and glued. We recognize where we end and the other person begins, right? And we're still recognizing that we're interdependent with them. So it's recognizing separateness and interdependence. And so it can be things like expressing concern and care about what's going on with the other person and what's going on with that group. Letting them know proactively, hey, this might affect your group too. This is something that we need to pay attention to. Thanking people for bringing up problems even when it was hard for them to do that. Acknowledging that there is another person on the other end of the conversation. And so you can see how this contributes to these organizational behaviors as well. Particularly when we're talking about sharing risks, when we're bridging across to the other rest of the organization and we're talking about cooperating. The more that those patterns of connection show up at the individual level in conversations, the more likely it is that these organizational level behaviors are gonna show up. So how do you use this? Because remember, I, guided, I said these are guidelines for action. So right, in practice, these are not independent, inter, independent, right? When you start to be a little less rigid, you're almost certainly gonna start to be a little more curious. But you can start to think about how do I usually show up in an interaction? And if I'm planning a conversation, I need to go talk to this person about this thing, you might say, you know, if I just YOLO this conversation, where am I gonna end up? by default. Oh, I'm probably gonna be here. Hmm, is that gonna be useful for that conversation? So instead of doing that, which sliders might I wanna move? Okay, maybe I wanna try to be a little less vague. I want them to experience me as a little bit more clear uh, or as a little bit less interrogating. And so you can start to think about what are adjustments that I need to make in order to help that conversation, that interaction go well. Now here's the important part. <clears throat> What happens in your head doesn't actually matter. Because this is about how the other person experiences you. They don't interact with what's up here. They interact with what's out here. So you need to start to think about behaviors that help you to move those sliders. And one of the guidelines for behaviors that Allison and I have come up with is, what is something you can do, say, or ask? If it isn't a, something that you can do, say, or ask, it's probably not a behavior. So what might I say that's gonna allow me to be less vague and more clear? What might I do that's gonna make me seem less distant? How might I adjust my behavior, right? And then during a conversation, maybe you didn't get a chance to play and plan for it, the compliance team just showed up, right? You can ask yourself, you can assess, where am I at right now? How is this person experiencing me? Are they experiencing me in the way that I want them to? 
And if not, what can I do, say, or ask to adjust that? And finally, you can, after the conversation, say, hmm, where did I land with them? Did they experience me as rigid? I might even go ask them later. Did I seem a little inflexible on that point? Yes. Okay, great. What did I do or say or ask that caused me to land there? How can I learn from that for the future? So this is actually a bonus heuristic. This is a thing we call plan, dance, retro. Recognizing we can use clear, curious, and connected both before, during, and after our conversations. So we can plan better ones, dance in the middle of the conversation, and retrospect afterwards. That is a lot in a very short period of time. I'm very excited about this work. I love talking about this. I appreciate if you come and find me. There's a QR code here if you want to go find the slides and a worksheet. The rest of the material is all up there. Thank you for your time today.